Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining CoAdvantage's HR Power Hour, Don't Labor Over Employment Law. And today we're going to go through uh, the program, and we have a special guest with us today to walk you through this. Quick legal disclaimer that this is not intended to be, um, even though we have an attorney with us today, it's not intended to provide specific guidance in your situation. So CoAdvantage does not render legal advice. Um, and we certainly would encourage you to reach out to your legal counsel and we'll also provide um, Brett's contact information if you'd also like to reach out to him for legal advice separately apart from uh, this presentation for your specific situation. To give you a little bit of information about CoAdvantage, we are a top 10 professional employer organization helping small and mid-sized businesses handle their HR needs. And that ranges from payroll, benefits, risk management, uh, HR administration, and we are currently serving about 4,500 clients and approximately 90,000 worksite employees, and we are very proud to do that. A quick introduction, I wanted to give you a little bit of background as well on Ford Harrison. Ford Harrison is a uh, national practice focusing on all aspects of labor and employment law, and they currently have about 200 attorneys in 28 office offices across the country. And they certainly do strive, and we've uh, been a partner with them in the past and can attest to this, they strive to provide clients with sound legal advice, practical consulting, and excellent client, excellent client services. So that is definitely a focus for them. Brett joins us today, Brett Yaw, who is counsel at Ford Harrison, and his focus is on practicing the representation of employers in labor and employment law matters, and we are very proud to have Brett with us today. My name is Christina Stovall. I'm the director of the HR Service Center at CoAdvantage, and uh, we'll kind of host today, but Brett is going to be delivering the presentation, and without further ado, I will turn it over to Brett. Thank you, Christina. Uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody uh, who has uh, joined the webinar today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be with me to talk about the new frontier of, of labor and employment law. And just as kind of a brief overview, what we're going to touch on is we're going to look at the, the new administration and you know how the new administration, the Trump administration, uh, has affected your, your, work, your workplace, as well as things that we think may happen um, down the uh, down the road um, with that new administration we've also seen new admin or new agency leaders um, so importantly we are going to talk about the EEOC uh, we are going to talk about the NLRB and we're going to talk about certain actions that those um, uh, agencies have taken um, we're also going to look at some of the deregulation efforts uh, that the Trump administration has pursued as well as some other areas some other updates uh, that I believe are important for you to know. Um, as I just stated, we're really going to look at how this new leadership, the Trump administration, may affect your workplace. Um, by its very nature, this presentation is, is much higher level. Um, and really, you know, what, what we're looking at is, is kind of the, the 30,000 foot overview of this administration, um, as well as some updates that we've seen in the court system. Uh, with the election of Donald Trump as, as president, um, you know, I don't think it's any surprise that this was a, a an unconventional uh, election um, that, that occurred uh, in 2016. Uh, President Trump had never held elective office before, uh, and he had joined uh, several others who uh, similarly had never held elective office. Yeah, he, he was a businessman who ran on a populist message, and he didn't have any really defined, clearly defined political or economic policies. Um, his, his candidacy divided uh, the country before as well as after the election, um, and we've seen a lot of Democratic opposition and legal challenges uh, to his executive actions. And I think one of the biggest things we've seen is, is uncertainty. I, I like to give a, a kind of theme, so something to think about, something to take away um, with my, my presentations. And, and I think that this is, this is an important one um, because we've seen uh, over uh, the course of the last just about year and a half now, um, the Trump administration um, uh, take a, a certain position on an issue and then take 
another position on, on that same issue. Um, so we've seen this kind of uh, uh, uncertainty uh, kind of back and forth with this administration. Uh, and I think that that's going to be, be um, uh, I hope I hope you can see that through throughout the course of the presentation. But I think that's a, a kind of a takeaway is, you know, as, as much as we, we want to be able to say this is how things are going to go over uh, the, the rest of the, the Trump administration, you know, we really can't speak definitively or be 100% sure on exactly what we think is going to happen, but certainly we are going to give you some, some best practices uh, to, to mitigate risk as well as information about the current state uh, of the administration and the law. So when Donald Trump ran as president, he had a, a kind of an overarching plan, and that was to save small businesses from the crushing burdens of unnecessary regulations that are stunting job growth and suppressing wages. Um, Several uh, federal agencies um, uh, certainly impact labor and employment issues um, that I just wanted to touch on. Um, we see a, a slow uh, process with these uh, labor and employment affecting um, uh, cabinet vacancies. Um, we have had Health and Human Services. Uh, we've had Department of Labor. Um, both both uh, individuals there has been confirmed. With the Wage and Hour Division, we have uh, Cheryl Stanton, who has not yet been confirmed. Um, OSHA, uh, Scott Mungo has not yet been confirmed, um, as well as um, the OFCCP and uh, the EEOC and the NLRB. We're going to talk a lot more in depth about the Equal Employment uh, Opportunity Commission as well as the National Labor Relations Board. Um, we've seen that the Trump administration so far um, has had a, a, an anti-regulatory tilt. Um, on January 30th, 2017, uh, President Trump issued an executive order that for every one new regulation issued, uh, at least two prior regulations must be identified for elimination. A group sued uh, shortly thereafter to block the executive order, um, but once it's an in fact, once the, a regulation goes into effect, um, it really is a, a cumbersome and time-consuming to to change that regulation. The Office of Management and Budget issued guidance about how they are going to identify uh, uh, regulations for elimination, and they're really looking at. Um, regulations being measured by their opportunity cost to society. So what is the value of the best alternative resource? Uh, and since that time that the executive order has been issued, it's really not clear uh, what the, the effect uh, has been uh, of the order. It's not clear whether this has uh, kind of cleared up the clutter of, of regulations that are either old or outdated. Um, also available um, to the administration is the Congressional Review Act. Um, this is an oversight tool um, that Congress may use uh, to overturn a rule issued by a federal agency. Um, Congress had passed this back in 1996, um, and up until 2017, uh, it had really been only used once. Um, but it still remains a, a viable approval uh, to overturn uh, rules issued by federal agencies. So. The way this occurs is once Congress passes a joint uh, resolution of disapproval, uh, the president signs it. Uh, and then final uh, rules that are issued in the last uh, 60 legislative days uh, of the previous uh, Congress. Um, I think it's no surprise uh, that uh, this administration has uh, made immigration a, uh, a, a large issue. Um, President Trump has proposed nationwide mandatory e-verify. Uh, that has not yet occurred, but it's something that, that he has proposed in, in the past. Um, the administration has also been critical of, of H visas, uh, particularly H-1B visas. In 2015, the uh, United States issued over 6,000 H class or H classification visas to citizens of Muslim majority nations. And employers who depend on H visas to obtain certain laborers uh, may be dramatic dramatically impacted um, by the, uh, the administration's uh, uh, criti criticism of the, uh, the H visas. On October 8, 2017, the Trump administration released immigration policy objectives, um, so just this past fall. 
And really, they, these, these objectives were, were three main categories. First was to ensure safe and lawful admissions. The second was to defend the safety and security of the United States. And the third was to protect American workers and taxpayers. And these objectives really aligned with uh, earlier administration pronouncements, um, such as Buy American, Hire American uh, Executive Order, as well as the, uh, the, the travel bans. And the uh, uh, administration also identified avenues for enhancing enforcement of immigration laws. On October 17, 2017, a district judge in Hawaii halted the third iteration of President Trump's travel ban. Um, this judge found that the ban suffers from precisely the same maladies as its predecessor and that it plainly discriminates based on nationality. This court held that the administration could not restrict entry of travelers from six of the eight countries that officials said were unable or unwilling to provide information that the United States wanted to vet citizens. This uh, uh, decision was appealed, and on, October, on April 25th, uh, 2018, the Supreme Court actually heard arguments uh, on appeal. Uh, so after about uh, an hour or so of, of oral argument, con the conservative justices appeared sympathetic to the administration's argument uh, that the administration has the authority to limit immigration in the name of national security. On the other hand, liberal justices expressed doubt about the uh, power to ban travelers indefinitely uh, and in spite of congressional law. Um, as is usual when, when there is a, a difficult to decide case, um, we look to Justice Kennedy. Uh, and Justice Ke Kennedy ap appeared conflicted uh, as to whether he would align himself with the conservative or liberal justices. Um, I think that, you know, to the extent that, you know, we all uh, want to read the tea leaves of these types of, of cases, um, you know, like I said, where, where we have a, a clear for justice uh, uh, block uh, on one side and a clear for justice liberal block on the other. Uh, justice Kennedy has often tasked the deciding vote in those matters. So again, with with immigration and the travel bans, um, Justice Kennedy is likely going to be the, uh, the, the justice that really swings this uh, one way or another. It's going to be a five to four vote. It just depends which way it's going to go and which way Justice Kennedy goes. So the outcome uh, is, is to be decided, um, but certainly the court will be weighing in uh, as to, to whether the administration actually has uh, the power to limit immigration. With the Affordable Care Act, um, President Trump had promised to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare uh, on day one uh, that he took office. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear that that promise did not occur, um, but since that time, uh, I'm sure you've all seen in the news that Republicans have attempted without success uh, to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act. Um, the most recent attempt at repealing and replacing um, was Graham Cassidy, um, which would have converted much of the law's uh, uh, spending to per capita block grants. Uh, some recent developments um, within the past uh, six, seven months or so, uh, the president signed an executive order on October 12th, 2017, which directed federal agencies to loosen the rules on association health plans and temporary insurance plans. And this was intended to allow more widespread offerings uh, of plans that don't uh, or did not adhere to the Affordable Care Act's mandate. There was some uncertainty how it would play out, um, but the thought was that this would push agencies to break up the insurance market. Um, this could encourage people to leave individual markets, which would pull healthy young people out of the, the uh, general risk pool. On October 17th, um, Senate, Senators uh, Alexander and Murray, um, Republican, Democrat, we have uh, Congress attempting to work across the aisle, uh, proposed uh, authorizing subsidies to insurers uh, for two years in exchange for granting states greater flexibility to regulate health coverage under the Affordable Care Act. 
President Trump stated that uh, he had been involved, and this was a short-term deal, which would get us over the immediate hump. Uh, the next day, President Trump tweeted that he could not support measures that he sees as bailouts to insurance companies. On, in December of 2017, the Congressional Tax Bill repealed the individual mandates enforcement, and that becomes effective in 2019. Um, and just this last month, um, the administration issued a final notice for health plans sold through the Affordable Care Act marketplaces um, in, in, in uh, uh, in a, essentially a follow-up to the repeal of the individual mandates. Um, that final uh, notice uh, permitted states to have more room to determine whether plans are gener or not, to be generous enough to meet the Affordable Care Act's requirements. Um, and it also provided an expansion of the uh, list of reasons that people may be excused um, from buying coverage. So all that is to say, wh wh where are we right now? Uh, I mean, the Affordable Care Act is still in force. It's, yes, the individual mandate uh, was uh, uh, repealed with the uh, Congressional Tax Bill in December, um, but the, the, the ACA itself is, is, is still there. Um, we should be complying with existing law. Um, I know it's, it's changing, uh, it seems, uh, quite rapidly, um, but we need to make sure that we're, we're staying up with it. I think it's no secret that the Affordable Care Act will be changed in, in some way, shape, or form, but really right now we're not really sure how or when. Um, so at this point, you know, it, it's, it's best to stay the course. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty, pretty clear over the events of the last uh, year, year and a half, um, that different plans have been proposed and uh, and, and haven't been uh, implemented. So I think it's, it's best for now to uh, just kind of keep an eye out and make sure uh, that we are in compliance. Turning now to the Supreme Court, um, we had uh, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, who was confirmed and sworn in in April of, of last year. Um, until the congressional tax bill passed in De December of 2017, um, this really was uh, President Trump's um, biggest win. Um, I'm not sure um, you know, how familiar everyone is with the dynamics of the court, um, but after uh, Justice Scalia passed away, um, there was a vacancy on the court that President Obama had sought to fill uh, with a more liberal-leaning justice. Um, Supreme Court justices are oftentimes one of the, uh, the, the a, a administration's uh, greatest assets in, in terms of being able to to uh, uh, nominate and have a justice confirmed because the thought is is that if your administration is the the, the, the group that's vetting nominating and having a justice confirmed that justice is likely to to uh, at least agree with with that administration's ideology so it's it's no surprise uh that that the uh candidate that uh, the Trump administration shows uh, has a conservative approach to the law. Uh, as I said, uh, this, this, there was a vacancy after Justice Scalia's death. So the thought was, well, you have the passing of one of the, the court's most staunch conservative justices. What happens if that, that vacancy becomes filled with a more liberal leading justice? Well, now you have more liberal justices than conservative justices. There's an imbalance in the court and kind of a shift, likely, with how cases were, were going to be decided. Uh, with the uh, confirmation of Justice Gorsuch, now we are back to a balance um, between the, the sides. So right now, we have four conservative justices. We have four more liberal justices. And as I said before, we have Justice Kennedy, who often plays the role of tiebreaker, whether that's siding with the conservative uh, portion of the bench uh, or the, the more liberal. So what has the Supreme Court been doing lately? Well, some, some cases to watch um, in particular are the class action waiver cases. And really what we're looking at is the, the legality of arbitration agreements that contain class and collective action waivers and whether they must proceed on an individual basis. 
generally speaking, Supreme Court decisions uh, in the past have upheld the use of arbitration agreements. That changed uh, recently when the National Labor Relations Board took the position that a class or collective action waiver violates employees' rights under the National Labor Relations Act to engage in protected concerted activity. Again, so when we're talking about class collective actions, we are talking about two or more individuals joining together and proceeding on the same causes of action. And the NLRB said that uh, uh, this pr prohibited individuals to litigate collectively in challenging an alleged unlawful employment action. Um, I, I think that um, you know we can talk about this more in depth when we talk about the National Labor Relations Board and what they've been up to. But I always think it's really important to note that that the National Labor Relations Act and the National Labor Relations Board it it it's not just whether we have a union in our workplace, and if we don't, then you know it's it's we we don't necessarily need to keep up with what's going on uh, with the board. The National Labor Relations Act applies to union and non-union employers alike. Uh, you can have a non-union workforce and have an unfair labor practice charge uh, filed against you. Um, saying that that we violated uh, an individual's rights to engage in protected concerted activity. So I think it's really important to, to uh, uh, be aware that just because we don't have a union in our workplace, that doesn't mean that these cases don't apply to us. That tangent aside, um, the Fifth, Eighth, and Second Circuit Courts of Appeal have all rejected the National Labor Relations Board's position. They've said, no, this doesn't violate employees' rights. Employers are free to engage with employees and enter into uh, these types of arbitration agreements. On the other hand, the Seventh Circuit said, yeah, we, we agree with the NLRB's argument. Um, and the Ninth Circuit said, we agree to unless there's an opt-out provision. So uh, the Supreme Court accepted appeals from the Fifth, the Seventh, and the Ninth Circuits. Uh, and Oct on October 2nd, uh, the Supreme Court heard oral argument in three consolidated cases uh, that are really going to decide the future of class action waivers um, in the uh, the employment context, and you can see there those are the uh, the 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 three consolidated cases that the, uh, the court will decide. One of the employment cases impact that. 
Uh, federal circuit courts are actually split uh, over whether Title VII of the, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 covers sexual orientation. Uh, right now, the Seventh Circuit ruled that Title VII must be read as including sexual orientation as it is essentially the same as sex discrimination. And in that case, the, the Seventh Circuit really looked at the, the, the law when passed hasn't needed to evolve into today's today's workplace, essentially. Um, the Eleventh Circuit, where I'm located, uh, ruled that Title VII was never never really envisioned sexual orientation as a protected classification, uh, and they they stated that until the Supreme Court decides otherwise, um, it's bound by precedent. Um, this case um, was actually appealed uh, to the Supreme Court. Um, but the Supreme Court decided that it wouldn't hear uh, this appeal. Um, the Second Circuit uh, recently, within the past couple months, ruled that a worker's sex is necessarily a factor uh, in discrimination based on sexual orientation. Um, so all that is to say we have different circuits holding different things. Um, when it, it, it comes to matters like this where we're interpreting federal law, uh, these circuit splits become very important as well as a, a signal to the Supreme Court that, hey, Supreme Court, we need some guidance over here. Does Title VII include sexual orientation within sex discrimination or does it not? We, we need to know one way or another. So I think, you know, it, it's not, not, you know, you know, if the Supreme Court opines on this issue. Um, it, it's more so, you know, when uh, the the court is going to do so. Um, as we'll talk about with the EEOC uh, here in in a second, you know, I I think generally as a best practice, um, it, it is as far as risk mitigation a best practice just to read uh, Title VII to include sexual orientation uh, within a protected classification. Again, it may not be in your, your circuit, um, but as far as risk mitigation, I, I say it's a best practice um, because you will effectively eliminate claims uh, that come up uh, based on sexual orientation. I'll give you an example. If we are in a circuit that says sexual orientation is not protected and we make decisions based on sexual orientation uh, and our defense is, well, our circuit doesn't recognize sexual orientation, that doesn't prohibit an individual from filing a claim with the EEOC. And as we'll see in a couple slides, that EEOC claim of discrimination based on sexual orientation is likely going to be met with traction in the EEOC as the EEOC recognizes sexual orientation as a protected classification. So then we get into not only are we dealing with the EEOC and the potential threat of litigation from the federal government, um, but also uh, the the threat of a lawsuit being filed against us. Again, just because the circuit says that it's not recognized doesn't prohibit the individual from filing the lawsuit. So that's why I say it's kind of a, it, it's one of my best practices. Just assume that sexual orientation is included within uh, Title VII uh, because it, it will help to mitigate risk. Moving on to the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, um, right now we have uh, Victoria Lipnick who has been appointed as acting chair. Um, as of uh, late last month, she is still the acting chair. Uh, she actually began serving as an EEOC commissioner in 2010 after being nominated to serve um, by President Obama. Uh, President Obama again uh, nominated her to serve a second term uh, ending in 2020, uh, and this is this is good news. Uh, typically, we think for for employers, um, I, I, you know, she so far uh, appears to have steered the EEOC away from the aggressive employee friendly initiative um, uh, taken by predecessors. Um, 
She has uh, uh, joined bipartisan initiatives um, such as voting for the uh, 2012 EEOC background check guidance, uh, but she also opposes the EEO1 uh, pay data initiative. Um, so I think kind of overarching theme for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, we are going to see more of a focus on making sure employers are complying with the law rather than taking punitive measures uh, trying to enforce it. Um, some other nominees, uh, we had Janet Dillon. Um, she was an attorney who served as general counsel for JCPenney, um, US Airways, and Burlington Stores. Uh, she chaired the Retail Litigation Center. Um, we also had Daniel Gade, uh, who is a former George W. Bush uh, policy advisor. As I mentioned uh, a couple slides ago, um, we have this EEO1 pay data reporting. Um, on August 29, 2017, the EEOC had uh, announced that they had been notified uh, that the White House Office of Management and Budget plans to stay the effective date for pay data collections provisions for the revised EEO1 form. They called it unnecessarily burdensome, uh, and you know the the existing but our existing obligations haven't changed. Um, there was a recent extension of the filing deadline. Um, previously, I believe it was the end of March. Um, now it is has been extended to June 1, uh, 2018. As I said previously, um, the EEOC has issued guidance on sexual orientation. Uh, in 2016, the EEOC um, issued uh, some new workplace harassment guidance, and the comment period uh, expired earlier this year. Uh, this report offered a wide-ranging look at preventing harassment and included recommendations for employers. Um, I, if you have not already, I would recommend um, reviewing this, this proposed harassment guidance. While it is a much more broad-based look at what harassment is and isn't and the types of recommendations for our workplace, it is still worth knowing and understanding where the EEOC stands on this issue so that we can be prepared uh, to make sure that in the event that you know we are uh, faced with a harassment charge, we understand what the EEOC's viewpoint on this issue is going to be. Uh, that proposed guidance took the position that Title VII sex discrimination ban uh, included protecting uh, uh, against sexual orientation bias. Um, LGP, LGBT advocacy groups applauded the inclusion, um, but some of the comments from business groups say that the EEOC's inclusion of gender identity, transgender status, and sexual orientation go beyond the plain language and legislative intent of Title VII. In that Second Circuit case that we talked about previously, the EEOC actually filed a what's known as a, a friend of the court uh, brief um, supporting a gay man who claimed uh, sexual orientation discrimination. They also filed amicus briefs in the Seventh and Eleventh Circuit cases as well. Again, th these briefs, amicus brief means uh, a friend of the court, um, and they were filing briefs in uh, uh, support of the uh, uh, the plaintiff's position. It's worth noting that the EEOC's position is now at odds with the Justice Department's policies. Uh, Attorney Je General Jeff Sessions had previously sent out a memo uh, to federal prosecutors um, stating that Title VII does not prohibit discrimination based on their gender identity per se. This re reversed a path set out by the former Attorney General Eric Holder. Um, so again, it is um, worth noting that the EEOC does consider um, sexual orientation um, as well as uh, gender identity to be uh, a protected classification um, under Title VII. I also wanted to talk about the EEOC's strategic enforcement plan. So what are the EEOC's priorities? Um, over the last few years and likely in, in the future, these, these are really where, where we're looking at the EEOC to go. Um, they want to eliminate barriers in recruitment and hiring. So the EEOC is going to target uh, class-based recruitment and hiring practices that discriminate against racial, ethnic, and religious groups, um, older workers, 
um, women um, and people with, uh, um, uh, with disabilities. Protecting immigrant, migrant, and other vulnerable workers, uh, the EEOC is going to target disparate pay, uh, job segregation, harassment, trafficking, and discriminatory policies um, that affect um, uh, vulnerable workers who may be unaware of their rights under the equal employment laws uh, or reluctant or unable to, uh, uh, to exercise them. Um, where do we see the, the EEOC going in, in the future? Well, some possible actions when we have a Republican-controlled commission uh, as well as uh, a general counsel. We're going to see a less expansive view of interpretations of law and the commission's authority. We're going to see more reasonable positions taken by the EEOC in settlement. Um, I'm not sure how many of, uh, of you all participating today um, have ever had the opportunity uh, to, uh, to engage with the EEOC in either the conciliation process, which is kind of their, their informal settlement process before they file a lawsuit, or tried to resolve a, uh, uh, cases with the EEOC uh, after suit has been filed. Uh, and I can tell you um, from, from my experience um, that the, the EEOC, um, not only are we, were we talking about monetary relief, so we're going to settle for a sum of money, but there were also many non-monetary uh, uh, provisions to these settlement agreements that employers essentially, it was either take it or leave it from the commission. Things like training all of our employees for a period of years, training all managers, making sure that training material was reviewed by the EEOC, making sure our policies were reviewed by the EEOC. Um, the things that can be, be uh, uh, very cumbersome uh, and uh, 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 time consuming for employers to undertake. So I think that we're going to see you know, more reasonable positions by the commission. I think we're also going to see fewer and uh, fewer uh, uh, lawsuits by the EEOC, but more mainstream ones that are being filed. So um, I, I, like I said, I, I think that the number of lawsuits will go down, but we'll see that the, the issues that they are, are pursuing are, are more uh, uh, mainstream in nature. Uh, Daniel Gade told senators uh, that he held a, quote, sincere belief that most discrimination is unintentional and could be prevented with better information. Uh, and Janet Dillon told senators that she saw uh, her own success uh, as a, quote, testament to the impact of the EEOC, end quote, and promised to take the e on the EEOC's backlog of cases while treating litigation as a last resort. I think those two quotes are, are pretty telling as to the direction of the commission um, and kind of where we might go in the future. Um, as you can see here, I just wanted to give you an open kind of a, a, a broad based look at it, the charge statistics and how many charges are being filed per year. Um, we've seen them go down um, in fiscal year 2017, but as you can see, you know, it's still uh, just over 84,000 charges uh, were filed uh, in fiscal year 2017. Um, that, that, that's an awful lot of charges. Um, you can also see in fiscal year 2017 that the number of lawsuits filed um, by the uh, commission uh, went up to 201. That's a number that uh, uh, we think will likely go down. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, um, is currently led um, by uh, uh, career people. So you have Alexander Acosta. Secretary of Labor, Lauren Sweat, the Assistant Secretary. Um, there are vacancies, though, for the Chief of Staff as well as senior advisors. Uh, like the EEOC, we're going to see fewer regulations issued, um, and it's going to be more informational and compliance-based approaches to business rather than confrontational and aggressive enforcement. I think that that kind of captures the mentality from at least a labor and employment perspective of, of where we see these federal agencies going, not whether it's the, the EEOC, OSHA, the Department of Labor, uh, or the NLRB, 
you know, I think that we are going to see a, a, a more compliance-based based approach, a more employer-friendly uh, approach to the, uh, the matters which those respective agencies handle. Uh, on January 13th, um, OSHA uh, issued the recommended practices for anti-retaliation program as OSHA enforces uh, 22 whistleblower protection laws. Some recent updates with OSHA. Um, on January 30th, um, 2017, uh, OSHA took down uh, from its website the justification for publishing data from individual employers' injury and illness logs. Uh, OSHA predicted that it would start publishing injury and illness data after July 1, 2017. Um, by 2019, about 46, 466,000 work sites with more than 20 employees. Um, currently, this rule is being challenge in federal court. Um, OSHA has also taken the position that union representatives may accompany OSHA inspectors during inspections of non-union workplaces. Uh, this rule is also being challenged in court. Uh, in a motion filed in February 23, the attorney told the court it needed a 30-day delay uh, to allow the Trump administration adequate time to review the policy. Uh, likely uh, because it's going to back off that policy. Um, and OSHA is reviewing other provisions of its final rule to improve tracking of workplace injuries um, and intends to uh, publish a notice of rulemaking in sometime uh, in 2018 to reconsider, revise, or remove uh, portions of that rule. Uh, litigation continues uh, on OSHA's rule uh, that took effect on December 1, 2016, uh, that drug testing policy should limit or should be limited um, or for, for post-accident testing to situations in which employee drug use is likely to have contributed to the incident uh, and for which the drug test can accurately identify an impairment uh, caused by drug use. However, if an employer uh, conducts drug testing to comply with the requirements of a state or federal uh, law or regulation, like workers' compensation, the employer's motive would not be retaliatory and the rule would not prohibit such testing. Uh, moving on to the National Labor Relations Board, uh, here are our uh, the board as it is currently constituted. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, uh, one member up uh, whose term expires in August of this year. And we have one vacancy. And uh, Peter Robb, the general counsel, was sworn in on November 17, 2017. Uh, Mr. Robb's term expires in 2021. Uh, and he is a former director uh, at the law firm uh, Drowns Racklin Martin. Um, the, the general counsel, it's important to note, um, is the individual at the board that really determines the path, the, the issues that the board uh, takes up um, at that time. Um, so, it's, again, I think that's, that's important to note um, because with Mr. Robb's um, confirmation as a former uh, 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 labor and employment attorney, um, we will see, likely see um, different issues being raised uh, from the previous general counsels um, who had focused on things like um, social media in the workplace, uh, the expedited election rules, uh, as well as um, uh, uh, employers' policies and procedures, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Some things to look for with the um, uh, the NLRB. Um, Purple Communications was a, a fairly big case that was decided um, uh, a few years back. And in that case, um, the NLRB held that an employee's use of email for statutorily protected communications on non-working time must be presumptively permitted by employers who have chosen to give employees access to their email systems. All that means is to say, if we give our employees access to our email system, we have to permit them to, to use our email for Section 7 protected concerted activity on non-working time, meaning our employees can use our email system to effectively organize uh, or communicate about these types of issues on non-working time using our email system. 
Um, so that's something that we think will be taken care of, uh, take, taken up um, during the course of this administration. We're also looking at specialty health care, which was a case that uh, allowed for micro units to be formed, where we're looking at this overwhelming community of interest. It's under specialty health care that permitted a Macy's shoe department uh, to, to organize. Um, and I cannot remember whether it was the men's shoe department or the uh, uh, female shoe department it was one of the two um, but the the board found that those uh, individuals working in that Macy's shoe department shared an overwhelming community of interest with one another um, we're also going to see uh, joint employment taken up um, and the board the Browning Ferris decision which said that when we have uh, uh, two entities and we're determining whether they are joint employers for terms of, of liability under the National Labor Relations Act, we don't need to have one exercising direct control over the other entity. All we need is indirect control, the prospect of control. We're actually going to talk about that on the next slide, um, but that's something that's going to probably come up again uh, as the board's uh, recent decision uh, was vacated. It's also significant to note that the uh, that the McDonald's uh, litigation um, was uh, uh, at least a settlement has been agreed to um, has not yet been approved. Um, regarding uh, uh, franchise or franchisee relationships. Um, in that case, um, the board had sued uh, or, or brought, brought a, a case against uh, McDonald's, essentially claiming that um, it was a joint employer uh, with uh, workers who worked at McDonald's franchisees. So you have the corporate and as well as the, the franchises. And the board was trying to assert Hey, these are these are joint employers. Um, the the settlement, which still has to be approved by a uh, an NLRB judge, um, would allow McDonald's to avoid a ruling that it is a joint employer um, of Mc workers at McDonald's franchises uh, and being held liable when franchisees violate federal labor law. Uh, we also are going to see whether the expedited election rules will stand after this administration. The expedited election rules um, were a fairly big deal when the final rule came out. Um, previous to that, when a union filed a uh, filed their their uh, certification for a unit um, to have a, uh, a vote as to whether a unit would be unionized or not, uh, typically it took about. 40 plus days from the time the initial filing was made with the board until we have the secret ballot election. With the expedited election rules, that shrunk. Now it's between 14 to 21 days uh, between the initial filing and the election itself. So we're going to see whether that's uh, overturned and the old standard put in place. Uh, and the final thing um, that, that I wanted to at least mention was that. Uh, uh, just before the new year, um, the board issued a decision um, that really rolls back um, the, uh, the uh, scrutiny that the previous board uh, had placed on employers and their handbook policies. Uh, I, I hope everyone prior to this had uh, been reviewing their handbook um, and, and looking at it with an eye to whether provisions in our handbook could be reasonably construed by employees, whether they would chill uh, their uh, rights to engage in protected concerted activity. Now, uh, the board on December 14th actually issued a decision that replaced this reasonably construed standard um, when, to where we're now looking at the nature and extent of the potential impact on NLR, excuse me, NLRA rights and the employer's legitimate justifications associated with the rule. Um, so all that is to say, we still need to evaluate our policies and procedures, um, but we are going to do that in a light that is in a little more deference to, to us as the employer. Uh, as I said earlier, um, the joint employer standard is something that, that is something to keep an eye on moving forward. 
the NLRB vacated its decision in Highbrand um, and reinstated the joint employer uh, standard in Browning Ferris. The board's reversal was due to an apparent conflict of interest created by board members William Emanuel's participation uh, in the Highbrand decision. Under the high brand standard, uh, an entity is a joint employer only where it has exercised direct and immediate control over the essential terms and conditions of employment of the other entity's employees, such as hiring, discipline, termination, suspension, and direction. Um, as I said previous, Browning Ferris said all we needed was indirect control, the prospect of control. Whether or not we actually exercise that control or not, the ability to exercise that control was enough. Um, this is likely a, uh, uh, a temporary reinstatement. Um, it, it's going this issue is going to come back up again. Um, uh, Mr. Robb has ordered all regional directors um, to send uh, any joint employer cases that address the issues in Browning Ferris uh, to the Division of Advice, likely so the board can take this issue up again. Um, and finally, we come to the Department of Labor. Um, we, as we all know, um, the uh, Obama administration's Department of Labor had the final overtime rule, which was set to take effect December 1st, 2016. Seems so long ago that that was going to happen, um, but it was going to increase the salary threshold for the white collar exemptions to $913 a week or, or $47,476 a year. Um, when we worked with employers, really our, our options were to either raise salaries or to reclassify the position as, as non-exempt and pay that person hourly. Um, where we are now, uh, you know, as we, we all know, um, you know, this has been um, uh, effectively eliminated. Um, this was challenged uh, in the District Court of, of Texas. I can't remember if it was the Eastern or Western Division, um, but uh, the, uh, uh, the court actually issued an injunction halting the overtime's rule uh, implementation, uh, and then the judge actually uh, granted the, uh, the employer and the state and business groups that sued uh, summary judgment saying, in effect, that the, the Department of Labor had overstepped its bounds, um, that they had raised the salary uh, basis level so high that we didn't really care about the duties test anymore. All we were really looking at was the salary basis test. All that is to say, I do think that the uh, uh, the salary basis test is going to change in the future. Um, Secretary Acosta, during his confirmation hearings, said that he thinks the, the salary range should be uh, in the, the low $30,000 uh, level. Um, so again, I, I think that we are going to see the Department of Labor uh, take this issue up again, which is uh, which means that all that hard work that we put into getting prepared for that in December first 26 deadline it's not all for naught um, I think that we are we can reuse all of that time energy and effort that we spent looking at our positions when this issue comes down the pike again because like I said I think that this is uh, a, a when um, not an if um, also in DOL news, uh, in January, uh, tw nearly 20 opinion letters uh, previously published under the Bush administration um, were reinstated. Um, and the DOL also said that they are going to start issuing opinion letters again. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, opinion letters are, are uh, literally letters uh, where employers write into the Department of Labor about questions that they have, issues that have arisen, uh, excuse me, in their workplace. And the Department of Labor gives its position on those questions and issues. They're tremendously helpful to understand how the Department of Labor views uh, certain issues under the law. Uh, in March 2018, the Department of Labor rolled out a new nationwide pilot program called the Payroll Audit Independent Determination Program, which is designed to streamline the resolution process of potential overtime and minimum wage violations uh, uh, of the FLSA. 
nickname paid. Uh, employers must audit their pay practices for potential non-compliance if they want to participate in this, this uh, pilot. If the employer discovers a non-compliant practice or believe its pay practice may be compliant, but which is to take proactive steps to resolve any potential claims, the employer then must take the following four steps. They have to identify the potential violations, identify affected employees, identify time frames in which the employee was affected, and calculate the back wages the employee is believed uh, owed to each affected employee. Uh, if Wage and Hour uh, approves the employee's request, it will inform the employer of the manner of transmitting the required information to the Wage and Hour Division. Um, the, this program is expected to run approximately six months, um, so we'll see whether this is something that uh, the Department of Labor adopts on a more permanent basis. I also just wanted to, wanted to provide you with uh, um, some of the top 10 settlements of, of 2017. Um, while two involve uh, state-specific claims, um, these are, are, are the, the figures uh, to resolve wage and hour claims, the, the top 10 settlements. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a tremendous amount of money. Um, as an aside, while we're talking about the FLSA, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, when we're talking about the discrimination claims, what we can do to mitigate risk. Um, wage and hour law is, is the area in which we can firmly take control of our pay practices. We know what the law says, we can audit our pay practices, and we can ensure compliance with the law. Does that mean someone that, you know, may not go out and, and file a lawsuit? No. Um, but certainly it's one of those areas that we can know what our pay practices are. We can know whether they comply with the law or not. Uh, and again, it, it, we can really take control um, and, and do our best to mitigate risk um, uh, under the FLSA. Uh, one of the things I think it's worth keeping uh, an eye out is whether we're going to see any changes to the federal minimum wage. Um, the federal minimum wage of $7.25 uh, per hour hasn't increased since 2009. Um, the Trump administration's position is unclear, especially some of, uh, given some of, some of President Trump's comments during his candidacy. Uh, in May 2016, he said, I don't know how you live on 725 an hour, but I would say let the states decide. In July of 16, he said the federal minimum wage has to go up. People are at least $10, but it has to go up. In November, the question was asked, so do not raise the minimum wage? And he responded, I would not do it. And then in November, Later that month, he said, I I'll, I'll say raise the minimum wage to 15, raise the minimum wage to whatever it might be. Separate and apart from what the federal government does, um, it's worth noting that 29 states and the District of Columbia have higher state law minimum wages. Um, as, as we know, the FLSA tells us where a state has a more beneficial law for an employee we have to follow that more beneficial law. So where uh, the minimum uh, wage is higher than the federal minimum, we have to pay the higher wage. Um, at least 34 cities or localities have also increased wage requirements higher than the state, uh, state requirements, uh, like Seattle uh, and New York City. Florida minimum rate so Florida, Florida minimum wage rose to 825 in, in 2018, just to, to give you an example. Um, as we, we kind of begin to, uh, uh, to wrap up here, I wanted to give you some, some best practices to, to mitigate risk, uh, again, particularly in light of wage and hour law. Um, require timekeeping for employees, uh, including exempt. Uh, I had a question asked, well, Brett, doesn't that, uh, doesn't that look like we're, we're not paying somebody on a salary basis? No, no, the, 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 the text of the federal regulations for salary basis expressly recognize that timekeeping for employees, including exempt employees, is permissible. Um, audit job descriptions for exempt positions to determine if they match actual duties performed. Remember, for our exempt positions, it's not just whether we're paying these folks 4.55 a week. 
we have the salary basis test, and we have the duties test. Just because we pay somebody a salary doesn't make them exempt. It's one of the biggest misconceptions I run into about exemptions. Make sure that the duties that they are performing not only are exempt duties, but also that they match the duties that the individual is actually performing in the workplace, because that's what we're going to look at. We're not going to look at the job description. Have employees sign off on, on pay and time records, verifying that they are accurate. Require the employee and the supervisor to sign off on changes to time records so that we, we know everybody knows uh, that this is uh, what happened. Train our managers on lawful pay practices. Uh, I know that how difficult it can be to train managers. Uh, I, I understand, um, but we don't necessarily need our managers to be experts. What we need them to do is to have that kind of sense, that red flag go up in their head and they say, hey, this employee is raising questions about their pay. We need to involve HR. That's really what we're going for when we talk about training management. Um, and putting pay practices in writing and having them signed off on employees. Um, again, I think that kind of where we see uh, wage and hour law going in the future, um, potential raising of the minimum wage, the use of the tip credit has been a big deal on a national level, um, and raising the threshold level of, of the salary basis in the, under the FLSA as well as state law. Um, some employment cases to watch in 2018, again, we're, we're looking to see whether Browning Ferris is again reversed. We're looking, does Title VII protect against discrimination based on gender identification? What about whistleblowers? The Supreme Court uh, just articulated uh, at least four um, uh, whistleblowers under the, uh, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street uh, Reform and Consumer Protection Act that it, it applies only to those who have reported their allegations to the Security and Exchange Commission as of the time of the allegedly retaliatory conduct. We're also going to be looking at whether class and collective waivers are, are permissible in our workplace. Um, and, uh, and, and finally, uh, we're, we may see the expansion of the number of right-to-work states, um, including the potential for right-to-work zones by political subdivisions uh, uh, of states. That number is now up to 28, with Missouri being the latest of February 6, 2017. Um, and just as a final kind of aside, um, I often run into kind of some, some confusion about right to work versus um, at will um, with, with, uh, uh, with employers. That those two terms kind of uh, uh, get confused sometimes. Right to work, all that means is we don't we are not going to be forced or required to join a union uh, uh, upon hire. That's, that's all that means. Um, so they are, are two separate and distinct concepts. So um, with that, um, where do, do we have any, 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 any lingering questions? Um, hey, Brett, this is Christina. We did get a couple in. I know we're over time just by a couple minutes. So we'll, um, roll through a couple of the questions sure, that sure. we see. But the EEO1 change date to June, is that going forward or is that just 2018? That's so. That that's just for for. It's my understanding. It's just for 2018. Um, I have not seen anything that says that that um, June is now the the new date um, for 2019 or 2020. Um, it's my understanding that um, the uh, uh, the delay uh, or the uh, um, modification is just for this year, as of this point. Okay, and I know there are several other states that are chiming in on the federal har or on a harassment law. Do you see any provisions for that at a federal level that will require training employers to provide training? Um, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, certainly that's that's something. You know, one of the the um, you know one of the the EEOC's issues is is preventing systemic harassment in the workplace. So certainly, to the extent that um, you know that that um, we can and it's feasible, training is never a bad idea. I always recommend making sure that not only we're providing our managers with training because our managers are our eyes and ears as well as uh, legally the company itself. Um, so the more that we can train them, the better. Um, 
uh, as well as training our employees to recognize it and bring it to our attention. Um, but I don't necessarily see that, that it's going to be required on a national level. But I do think that that's a, a great point um, that, you know, uh, that I believe it was um, New York just the other day um, uh, passed a, a harassment uh, statute. So, you know, this this is something that's evolving, you know, part of part of when when the government kind of backs off on enforcement, um, that opens up the uh, the door for states to come in and take action. And certainly we've seen that they have. Um, so I would encourage everybody, as, as I said previously, with, with um, the, the employment laws, to make sure that we know what the law is in our state, to make sure that we're complying with that, the, the state law as well as federal law. Okay. All right. And we'll, we'll wrap up here. Um, just a couple of other slides. If you do have questions, please reach out to your designated HR consultant or the service center. Um, we do have some additional webinars coming up, so we would certainly invite you to join us for those. And then Brett's information will, um, you're welcome to contact him. I'm gonna throw you out there, Brett. We're gonna, you're welcome to contact him as well if you have specific questions about what was presented today or you're welcome to contact me um, and I can certainly link you with him. Or if you have questions, like I said earlier, about your particular situation uh, that you wanna review with Brett, please, um, please go ahead and reach out to him too. And thank you, Brett, so much for um, all of the great information today. I know it's a lot, uh, but we certainly appreciate you dissecting that for us. So thank you all for joining us, and we appreciate your time and hope you'll join us for the next webinar. Thank you.